Good afternoon to all of you joining us online today for our Perspectives in Nursing webinar series. Welcome, everyone. My name is Emily Eberly, and I am your technical producer. Here's a big thank you to Dale Medical Products, who is our sponsor for today's program. And now, I'd like to introduce you to Tom Hancock, who is our moderator and who will introduce you to today's speaker. Tom, are you ready to get started? I am. Thank you so much, Emily. My name is Tom Hancock, and I'm the executive director of GEDSA. GEDSA is the Global Enteral Device Supplier Association. It was formed back in October of 2013. And our primary initiative is the Stay Connected Initiative, which is to allow awareness and adoption of the NFIT ISO standard connector. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to our speaker for the topic, Adopting New Enteral Connectors. Dr. Peggy Gunter is a good friend of mine, and she is the Senior Director for Clinical Practice Quality and Advocacy at the American Society for Parental and Enteral Nutrition, also known as ASPEN. She is well known in the field of nutrition support as a clinical nurse specialist, researcher, author of over 120 peer-reviewed publications, and was a former editor-in-chief of Nutrition and Clinical Practice. Dr. Gunter won the 2012 Cheers Award from the Institute of Safe Medication Practices and was inducted into the American Academy of Nursing. In her current position, she leads the Aspen efforts on enteral safety and the new NFIT connectors. As far as a disclosure statement, the speaker disclosed no conflicts of interest. Aspen does not endorse any brand of product presented in this webinar. Continuing education, and this is for nurses and dietitians. This activity has been approved for one contact hour of CNE by the California Board of Nursing and the Florida Board of Nursing. This program has been approved by the Commission on Dietetic Registration for one CPEU credit. At the end of this webinar, you can obtain those continuing education credits by logging on to www.saxtesting.com forward slash p. Complete the post-test and evaluation form, and upon successful submission, you will be able to print your certificate of completion. The accreditation provider, SACS Communications, is approved for the California Board of Registered Nursing, provider number 14477, and Florida Board of Nursing provider number 50-17032. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Peggy Gunter. Peggy, are you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Tom, and welcome all of you to this important topic about adopting new enteral connectors. Today, the learning objectives include the following. We want to outline the background as to why new enteral connector design standards are being implemented, describe safety features of the new enteral connectors through the enteral delivery system, define particular patient protocols where your practice will be changing due to new connectors and devices, and propose challenges and solutions to these particular issues that the new connectors pose. Hopefully this is not the first time um, that you've heard about these new enteral connectors, but if it is, I want to give you some background information. I'll go quickly through that um, so that we have time to really talk about the implementation and answer any questions you may have. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, small bore connectors. So small bore connectors are um, connectors with an inner diameter of less than 8.5 millimeters. They're used to link or join medical devices, components, and accessories for the purpose of delivering fluids or gases. So in this picture, you see a lower connector. And it is a classic type of small bore connector used commonly in healthcare setting. It's a universal connector, which is a good thing but it's also a bad thing. As you see in this picture of a neonate, you can see many different um, therapeutic systems all in a very small space. You can see arterial um, catheters, central venous catheters, epidurals, respiratory, and gastrostomy. And with that, um, you can see if there were similar connectors for all of those systems, how there would be a very high risk for misconnection. So, um, um, following a meeting in 2006, um, a group of uh, folks got together and wrote a paper for the Joint Commission Journal on quality and patient safety on misconnections in general and then particularly on enteral misconnections. And we defined that as an inadvertent connection between an enteral feeding system and a non-enteral system such as an intravascular catheter, 
peritoneal dialysis catheter, tracheostomy, medical gas tubing, etc. These are also known as wrong route errors or a small bore misconnection. With that, connection, impact of misconnections um, have been documented to be very high. Um, here are two stories of patients who um, suffered um, a fatal incident because of misconnections. Um, one was a 35-week um, pregnant woman was in the hospital. Um, she had been getting um, uh, parenteral nutrition in the past, but was now on enteral nutrition and had a pick line in place. Um, the nurse, assuming it was the parental nutrition, pulled out intravenous tubing from the floor stock, spiked the bag, and started the infusion of tube feeding through the patient's pick line, and um, both the mother and the fetus died. Another story was um, a woman was having a routine carpal tunnel surgical procedure, and a PACU nurse um, accidentally hooked the blood pressure monitoring device up to the patient's IV, which caused an air embolism and the patient died. Um, and these are just two incidences um, that are um, uh, pretty devastating. They're not only devastating to the patients, but certainly the nurses who inadvertently made these mistakes. Um, clinicians never mean to make these mistakes or make these errors, but they do because the system allows that to happen. So that's the reason why um, these changes were made. Why did these things happen? Um, these happen because of, of several types of factors, both human factors and physical and design factors. The human factors are things that there aren't a lot of things we can do about, um, clinician fatigue, distraction, and lighting issues. But then there are physical and design factors. Um, that allow this to happen. Um, some of the things I've talked about, such as um, use of lure connectors, compatible tubing be between unlike systems, and the use of IV syringes um, for oral medications. And in the, in the past, um, more often, universal spikes for different kinds of bags. So um, people said to me, well, how often does this really happen? Um, it happens probably more than you think, and certainly happens um, more than is reported. Um, here's a paper that was done in 2011 of um, 116 published cases of enteral misconnections that we could find in the literature. And uh, again, um, that doesn't seem like a lot as compared to the hundreds of thousands of patients who receive enteral nutrition. But again, like most errors, um, these are probably underreported. So here's an example of an enteral nutrition workaround, where you can see this is an enteral administration set, um, and because the patient had a jejunostomy tube with a lure connector on the um, end of it, the nurse had to take IV tubing, hook it into the enteral tubing, and then administer um, the formula to the patient. Um, we nurses are pretty creative in how we can hook things up, and in this case, um, uh, there was no, no untoward event for the patient, but it certainly was a very high risk and very dangerous practice. So where are the points of concern in the enteral delivery system? Um, here's a, a bag of formula. Um, one point of concern is where universal spikes used to go into these bags. Um, the other is farther downstream where you see um, access into what we call the patient access or patient end where extension tubing, syringes, and the administration sets go into the patient's feeding tube. Now, up in uh, um, about 2012, um, and even prior to that, but since 2012, certainly, um, most manufacturers are using this type of connector for this upstream or nutrition source um, it's called a, a, a spike right, and you will see on enteral um, bags and enteral tubing this type of connector upstream. That is actually becoming an ISO connector fairly soon. So many people ask me, what about color? Um, does color prevent misconnections? And the answer to that is no, not really. Um, what it does is the manufacturers have introduced color to try to trigger clinicians into preventing misconnections. Um, and as I said, but it does, the color in and of itself doesn't prevent misconnections. And the issue is the colors are not standardized over device types. So enteral, you can see um, 
uh, tubes that have white, tubes that have purple, orange, yellow, I've seen many different kinds. Um, and so you may have a green connector for an enteral device, but you may also have a green connector for respiratory, so that sort of defeats the purpose of color. And in the new connector standard, which we'll be talking about, um, color is not required. Now you may see manufacturers have different colors, and that's sort of a branding issue. Um, but um, the color, again, is not required. So in 2006, the Drink Commission um, sent out a Sentinel event alert where they urged manufacturers um, to implement incompatibility by design features. Um, they said you really need a physical barrier as the most effective preventive tool when people were trying to make inappropriate connections, um, and that each part, each therapy needed its own type of connection. In uh, around that same time, there was a California bill that was introduced, again, to force manufacturers to develop a different kind of system, and that law, um, which has now gone into effect July 1st, 2016, um, prohibits the use of intravenous, epidural, or enteral feeding connectors that would fit into each other, um, and that that, um, as I said, that bill is in, is in effect now, that law is in effect, and um, certainly drove change, um, at least in the United States and in California. So around, um, uh, from 2008, what was called an ISO, which is the International Standards Organization, loosely translated, um, developed a work group to begin working on small bore connector standards, and they developed uh, first, what's called a master standard, and that master standard um, said that these different connectors can't be compatible with each other, um, they had to be rigid or semi-rigid plastic, and um, they had to pass a misconnection test. And you can see by these um, blue circles that there were a whole series of other connector standards that had to be developed after this main 80369-1 master standard. So that was published, and um, then the next standard um, that was developed was the 80369-3, which is the enteral standard. Um, it's now been approved globally and published. Um, the FDA also put out a guidance last year about these types of connectors, and now with this ISO standard being published, they are going to come out with another guidance shortly um, and refer back to those published international standards. So here's the actual connector. So what we have now on the ends of feeding tubes are, um, is a Christmas tree type of male administration set um, and then a female type flexible feeding tube end. The new connector is called the NFIT connector. You'll hear us talking about NFIT. An NFIT connector is a harder plastic, um, and what it's done to, in to increase safety as well is that the whole flow has been reversed. So now the administration sets and um, syringes have a female end, and the tube itself has a male end. The administration sets were put into place um, last year um, in the spring, and now, um, and we'll talk about some of the challenges and why it took a while to, to have the um, rest of the system come online. But now the time has started, that July through December of 2016, we hope that enteral syringes and feeding tubes with the NFIT connectors will be put into place. So um, how do we connect the feeding tube and the new administration set that we have here with a tube that a patient may have in place, which is the old system. And what they did was develop what's called the transition connector. That allows fitment to the, um, from the current administration sets to the, to, um, from the new administration sets to, and new syringes to the current um, female type end of a feeding tube. Um, these are now packed into the administration sets. If you open an administration set, um, this transition set will be on the end of it or be in the package, and um, hopefully that will be around for a while. Um, in the administration sets, at least for a year or so, um, as we move through this transition, they will also be available separately as well.
So what about syringes? Um, syringes obviously are used to administer medicine, flushes, supplemental hydration, or bolus feedings through enteral tubes. Currently what we're using um, is a kind of a calf tip syringe or a lure tip, which I hope no one's using a lure tip um, because it increases the risk of uh, misconnections. But these are the current tubes. Um, what you'll need going forward is an as enteral syringe, a specific enteral syringe um, that will have an N-fit tip to it. So there's two, two types of um, N-fit tips. One is the standard N-fit and then there's something called the low-dose tip N-fit syringe and I'll explain that to you once we talk, start talking about medications. So what does this do to your nursing practice? So here are some common procedures that um, are conducted and nurses do with the feeding tubes. They verify tube position, ga check gastric residuals, flush the tube, administer feeding formula or human breast milk, administer medications, vent or drain the tube. And the one in red here is kind of a new procedure which we're encouraging um, people to uh, begin to think about. So because of that male end of the tube, um, we encourage people to clean it and I'll show you um, uh, a procedure for that coming up. So for the most part in your uh, feed in your nursing procedures, what's really changed, so for instance this is verified to position, um, nothing's really changed except that you'll be using the NFIT syringe with either an NFIT tube, which isn't shown here, or an NFIT syringe with this transition connector um, in order to make that connection. Um, same thing with checking gastric residuals. If that's still a practice in your institution, um, you'll again use the NFIT syringe um, for, with an NFIT tube or the transition connector. So flushing feeding tubes is obviously very important um, and will still be part of your practice. Um, when, it, when to flush is after verifying placement, which we just talked about, after bolus or intermittent feeding, before, after, and between multiple medications, and um, another way of flushing is the use of automatic flush pumps. So here's a short procedure about cleaning the feeding tube. And again, you can see why you might need to do that. You can see that there are ridges in here, there are threads, and then there's also this male tip inside the end of the feeding tube. So um, a tube may need periodic cleaning to remove medication or formula debris. We suggest a brush like a toothbrush or a bottle brush and warm water daily and PRN for tubes, particularly those in the home. There are also products coming out on the market um, to help with cleaning. They have little brushes on them um, and there's um, a variety of companies are putting out these types of cleaning devices. So um, as we were moving along with this transition and making plans for it, several clinical challenges came up um, and there are three main challenges which I'd like to talk to you about today. So the first one is blenderized diets in the home. So um, uh, the second one is uh, medication delivery, particularly low doses often given in pediatric or neonatal population. And the third is um, drainage from G or J tubes. So let me talk about blenderized diets first. So um, many more people in the home because of issues of reimbursement or because they feel like they want to eat the food that their family is eating have chosen to use blenderized formulas. Um, there are commercially available blenderized formulas and there are homemade blenderized formulas. So not all formulas are the same and not all tubes are the same. But we thought um, several years ago um, that we would try and see what the flow and pressure was to get through the NFIT connector and then also to get through the cath tip syringes. And um, when we measured them in a laboratory using a commercially available blenderized diet, they were essentially equivalent. Now other studies have come out that said they're not equivalent, that it's harder to get that blenderized diet formula through an NFIT um, connector or an NFIT syringe, and that's of concern. So it is really recommended that each company perform testing on its own line of tubes 
with a variety of formulas. Also at this time, um, Gatsit in cooperation with a large medical institution and also with the FDA are conducting studies of um, this flow and pressure using a variety of tubes and a variety of formulas. So there's more to come on that. Now medications. So there are three processes in medication delivery. First is the medication order. Second is medication preparation and dispensing. And the third is the actual medication administration. And these new connectors bring emphasis and protocol change to each one of these processes. So first of all, let's talk about the medication order. It is really important that we avoid silos between um, different groups um, in institutions or even at home in terms of um, ordering medications. So the prescribers need to know what kind of tube the patient um, has. The uh, pharmacy, the, and then when the prescription is written, it needs to be clearly communicated to the pharmacy about exactly where that tube is going. I mean, where that medication is going. Is it oral? Is it enteral? And many of you know, in a study done by Joe Bellotta several years ago, showed that even when medications were supposed to go into enteral, about 80% of them were ordered PO. So, as you can see, that would be a problem um, depending on if the pharmacy is preparing that and sending it up to nursing. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. But again, it's really important that everyone know uh, where this medication is going, what tube, what port, um, or is it oral? Or is it both? Sometimes um, um, you have the option to give it either way. So here is our, on the left hand side is our old um, style of connectors and the medication port. And then on the right hand side you can see is the new NFIT style. Again, they have medication ports, they have caps on that, and they have the main feeding port. So I want to talk a little bit about crushed medications first. Um, this happens now and this will continue to happen. That it is really very important that medications that are crushed, um, either and prepared in the pharmacy or prepared at the bedside or prepared at home, are crushed um, very finely and uniformly. Um, that is probably the number one reason tubes get clogged, is that medications are not pulverized properly and not mixed in um, to the solution of water, um, and it clogs up the feeding tube. Um, another thing is not to mix different crush meds together. Again, you can have drug-drug interactions that cause uh, uh, a big um, sort of a conglomeration of medications and um, that again may clog the feeding tube. And again, the patient's not going to be getting their medications. Uh, as you all know, you don't crush extended release medications. Then make sure that you flush before, during, and after each crush medication is added. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about um, these feeding tubes. Now as you remember, um, I said that the flow of syringes and um, administration sets and the tube was reversed. So what happened is that now um, the end of a syringe is actually a female end instead of a male tip. So what happened was um, that increased the dead space that was found in the tip of a syringe and so um, that would cause either overdosing or underdosing of very critical medications. So what folks in industry did is they developed what's called a low-dose tip syringe, and that, that is this one, where you can see the female tip, then inside is a little um, sort of a male within this female um, portion, um, and I'll show you another picture of that later. So um, they developed these new, it's called a low-dose tip syringe, um, and um, these were just approved by the FDA in two companies um, after they did some dose accuracy and user testing. It went very well, um, and industry stepped up and created these great um, new products. So um, depending on the manufacturer, these syringes can be anywhere from uh, 3 ml or less, or in some it are 6 ml or less that will have the low dose tip inside. This low dose tip syringe will mate very well with all other um, NFIT uh, female connectors. 
So how do you prepare the medications? So medications come either pre-filled from the pharmacy um, as liquid medications in a syringe. They come in unis do dose medication cups, and again, it depends on your institution and where you are and what type of medication is, or they come as tablets that need to be crushed and mixed with liquid for delivery. So, um, and I just wanted to bring your attention, this is something called medication straw. It's sort of a straw that goes in on the end of the syringe, and I'll show you a little bit about how to use that. So here we are. This is a closer look at this um, low-dose tip syringe, where this green, as you can see, is that inner tip within the female end of the syringe. It's important as you draw up medication that you don't, particularly in critical medications and particularly in um, neonates and pediatric patients, that the medication not spill into this moat, or if it does in this moat as you're pulling up a med, for instance, from a cup, that you clean out or some way tap the syringe or flick the syringe so that the medication does not sit in this moat. Um, it's probably a better practice to use a medication straw, again, to put the medication um, syringe on the end of the medication straw and put it either in the medication bottle or put it to the cup with the medication. So other things with medication administration is the decision on the part of the nurse if the patient is able to take medications both orally or by tube. So here is a low-dose tip syringe. And you can see on the end of it is a little flange here. And the reason that's there is because um, of uh, to prevent compatibility or to pre prevent connection with the tracheostomy tubes. So if, for instance, this end of this syringe uh, were put into the end of a tracheostomy, it wouldn't go all the way in because this flange here would prevent that. But this, provide, this presents a challenge. Um, in small babies who you may want to give this medication, and that's again in an NFIT syringe, um, if you want to give it orally, you can either give it orally or if FDA approved for both oral and enteral use, you can give it into the baby's mouth. However, in small babies, you may need to use some type of adapter to use this low-dose syringe because you'll want to put the syringe all the way back in the back of the baby's mouth so they don't spit out the medication. And, um, and people are concerned that this flange might be a problem. Again, we're all working through all of these things together. Um, if you have any suggestions about medication administration or ways you think um, they can work better, then we're certainly, um, I for one would be certainly love to hear some ideas. So other issues with medication administration that are concerning is that there's significant challenges with stocking in medication rooms and supply areas. So if you have to, um, for instance, stock um, uh, oral syringes and enteral syringes in a small medication room, um, you have to think about how you want to work that. Um, the same thing with pharmacies that have a whole slew of different, um, different types of syringes they need to work with. Another question is, what if the pharmacy sets up the med in an oral syringe and it needs to be given um, via an NFIT tube? That again, um, you need to think about that because again, as we spoke about communication, the communication is not always the best and um, the prescriber may have ordered a PA when you know that patient's NPO and you know that medication needs to be given. So um, you need to probably stock both types of syringes. Um, and um, transfer the medication from one syringe to another. Now, Aspen is currently working on um, a step-by-step -step medication preparation and administration procedures for both inpatient and home settings. Um, those will be distributed through our website and also be sent to GETSA um, at stayconnected.org where they will post them. They're also working on educational videos and graphic posters. Um, and these all should be out, hopefully, um, in a short order. Now, another challenge that we talked about um, with these new syringes is drainage through multi-lumen tubes or draining and venting, drainage and venting in general. So, as you see here, this is not a current, this is not an NFIT type tube, this is a current tube. 
But as you can see, there are, many, there are a variety of multi-lumen tubes where the stomach um, is, has an, a port here that empties the stomach, but then another tube that goes down into the small bowel um, and gets feeding. So often what happens is patients um, will hook the feeding to this port and then drain through a drainage device or venting air out through this side. Now some manufacturers may, and Tom, you can um, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, some manufacturers still um, have a choice here on this gastric arm of a multi-lumen tube. This, is, this particular arm of things is not really indicated for enteral feeding. These types of tubes are specifically designed to drain the stomach and feed into the small bowel. So some manufacturers may put NFIT on both of these ports, but they may only put NFIT on this feeding port and leave this um, gastric drainage port as is. And note something else, whenever there's a balloon here, this still is a lower connector. So in terms of drainage and venting, there's a number of things that happen. Um, there is um, a type of bag that you hook to the uh, gastric port, or you ho can hook even to your gastrostomy tube, which is a allows for air to drain and be vented during the night. Some people will also use a syringe, and some people will use a drainage bag. Now, the issue with many of these drainage bags is they're not um, just for draining enteral. They're used to drain bilirubin tubes or there's a whole variety of uses for these tubes. So because they don't necessarily always have an enteral indication, they may not be um, may not have an end fit on the end of it. So if you have a tube that has a gastric port that's um, going to be an end fit, and you need to drain through, um, you need to make that connection with the drainage bag. There are some adapters that are out and available where you would put the drainage bag in this end and you would hook the end, this into the end fit port. Again, there's lots of different, um, again, we, do, we don't want to use adapters if we can, but there are a lot of adapters and there are a lot of um, things out there that can help you improve your connectivity. Another issue that often comes up in ICU patients is early feeding through Salem sumps. And here you can see various adapters that are put into the end of Salem sumps. And so some of them uh, allow for early feeding through that Salem sump now. But when we switch over to enteral, you're going to need some type of adapter, um, some enteral access connector that can be used um, for and fit. And so you should acquire, inquire about that if a, that's a practice in your particularly in your intensive care unit. There will be these enteral access connectors that are going to have end fit ends. So what does this all mean? Um, how do we how do people find out about this and how has um, industry and clinicians work together? Um, it's been a really exciting process to watch industry come together um, under uh, the ISO process and then under the Global Enteral Device Supply Association. Um, to help communicate and get the word out about these important changes. Um, the purpose of the Stay Connected campaign is to get the word out. Um, GETSA has also been working with a real important core group of clinicians, um, suppliers, regulatory organizations, um, such as my own organization, pharmacists, FDA, Joint Commission, um, Amy, ISMP, and many other um, uh, group purchasing organizations and home care companies. Um, we're really trying to get the word out. This is happening now. This is the important thing is that you need to know this is happening soon. One thing that gets it did was put together transition checklists for um, a variety of audiences. This is just one um, checklist for nurses and clinicians to really look at the steps that they have to do to make this happen in their institution or in their home care agency. So you have to form teams and talk through all of these processes to make sure that everybody's on board and everybody's ready for this change. Another really helpful resource was um, in 2014, the Joint Commission put out this infographic 
um, on the tubing connect misconnections and what to watch for during the transition and how to manage risk. Um, in um, uh, this is available on their website. Um, they also included a, a statement and a paper. They also included a list of particular standards and the crosswalks for what surveyors will be looking for when they come to look and see what it is you're doing to address this need and to address this issue. And so I thought that was very helpful. So the last thing is um, for you to, to realize that this is happening now, to, for you to form a team if a team has not been formed already in your institution, um, uh, introducing these new connectors into the work stream. Again, this is very important to reduce tubing misconnections, improving safety. Uh, remind the organization um, about those patients. Remember, I always try to include those patient stories because these are real things that happen um, to clinicians and to patients. And remember that um, these short-term hassles of the transition are really worth these long-term benefits. Another thing that's very important is for you to um, communicate with all the stakeholders. So if you're in a hospital and you want to make this change, you make this within your institution, but you also need to realize the external stakeholders that might be impacted by this change. And so you need to reach out to, um, first of all, your supply chain folks to make sure they've got everything you need before you make the transition. But you also need to reach out to um, home care companies, long-term care, um, DME companies, folks that you regularly refer your patients to, to make sure that they're ready so that um, an individual doesn't have a new NFIT tube get sent back to a long-term care facility and they don't have the syringes or the bags or whatever it takes to take care of that patient. Um, and my big suggestion is to make sure that whoever you send out with a new tube in particular, that you send some syringes with the patient just to make sure that at least um, they can get their medications, they can get their um, flushes, and that you won't be stuck that way. You also want to think about um, uh, stakeholders that you might not think about, and that is, for instance, does your emergency department know about this? Do they have syringes in the emergency department um, to take care of patients that might come back in through um, uh, the ED and not um, come into the hospital per se? So um, in summary, I'm going to um, thank you. Uh, this is happening now, and I want to make sure that you're aware of this. Um, Tom and I will be happy to answer questions, and thank you for your attention. And now I'll turn it back over to Tom Hancock. Oh, Peggy, thank you so much for that very informative presentation. And I thought it was very thorough and allows folks to think about the entire scope of this transition to safer connectors and also think about how to best implement. So I really appreciate the time you took to run through all that and some of the challenges and questions that we've had leading up to the introduction. I do want to remind everybody that this is a presentation that's suitable for continuing education. Uh, we went through this slide earlier, so I'll just point out the www.saxtesting.com forward slash p is where you can go ahead and get your credits by logging into that address. You will also get an email in the next hour or so with further instructions on how to get your credits uh, going forward. So at this time, I'd like to open it up for some questions. I have a number that have been sent to me via the chat line, and so uh, I'll just say in no particular order, uh, we might as well go ahead and tackle these things. I will do my best to answer some of these questions as well as call on Dr. Gunter to help me with some of these to make sure that we give you the best answer possible. And so uh, the first question, um, oh, there's, a, there's actually a couple questions surrounding um, uh, red rubber catheters and the use of, of uh, certain catheters uh, that are, uh, I guess uh, I'll say, common practice today, uh, but may be considered to be off-label use, and I've even you've seen the term uh, MacGyver, uh, a, a type of uh, a use of a product such as this. Uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but the question is, will these uh, types of red brother catheters, um, Foley catheters, be available, and will they have the NFIT connector on them? And the best answer I can provide, and Peggy, I'd love you to chime in here as well, is that if the product is indicated for use for enteral feeding, then it should 
have the NFIT connector on them. If that device is used for other purposes and not indicated for enteral feeding, it will not have the NFIT connector on them. And so the red rubber catheter, the Foley catheter, uh, those are uh, there are other uses for that, uh, primary uses, I'll say, uh, for those types of devices. So you should not expect to see the NFIT connector on those types of devices. Now, uh, Peggy did mention that there uh, earlier in the presentation that there are um, combination types of devices with uh, uh, multiple indications for use where they may actually see an NFIT connector on, on, on one of the ports and maybe a female opening on the other port to allow for things like gastric emptying and things like that. Um, and so hopefully that uh, makes sense for you all. Um, but Peggy, uh, care to clarify anything or add to that? Sure. I think it's important that um, some of these tubes are used for more permanent um, measures like J. genostomy tubes. Um, I think it's important that you educate um, people who are putting these tubes in or considering putting these tubes in about this change. Um, we've tried to reach out to surgical uh, folks and others who may be using these tubes it's very important that a patient not go through surgery and then find out that they can't connect to their catheter to the um, they can't their enteral feeding will not connect now as you saw through this presentation there are a number of adapters that could probably be used in the short term but it's really important that um, that people who want to use those really look at the market and see there are a number of good J genostomy tubes on the market um, and those will be NFIT compatible. Those will have NFIT connectors on them. Again, some of these um, transition connectors and, um, and adapters will be around for a while, but they're not going to be around forever. Um, the whole idea was, was for us to make a seamless system and um, to have everything fit together. Um, and again, so trying to convince folks that um, this just isn't going to work anymore. Thanks, Peggy. I, I, it looks like I have somewhat of a related question from Deborah. Uh, the question is, please clarify the process for enteral, early enteral feeding with the Salem sump tubes. Okay, so the Salem sump tubes are used for gastric suction and gastric emptying. Sometimes in um, uh, for early feeding in ICU patients where they want to see if the patient will tolerate enteral feeding. Instead of taking out that Salem sump, putting in a feeding tube, trying, you know, 20 cc's an hour formula, and then finding out the patient can't tolerate it, having to take that out and put a Salem sump back in um, is very uncomfortable for the patient. So for the first day or so um, of early enteral feeding, you may want to use the Salem sump if you're not sure if the patient's going to tolerate it. Um, using one of these adapter kind of devices um, so that you could try enteral feeding, but it's not, a Salem sump is uncomfortable and it's not really um, certainly um, indicated for long-term enteral use. So once you give it a day or so, the patient seems to be tolerating it, uh, that tube really needs to be changed out for an a true enteral feeding tube. Does that make sense? It does. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, and so uh, there are some kind of follow-up questions. I'll try to get to those and then move on to some new ones. Um, one is, uh, you know, these surgeons understand the issue, but they don't feel there's a good alternative. What are some of the tubes that you are recommending? Well, you know, we're not in a position, neither Peggy or myself, we're in a, in a position to recommend a certain brand or certain company's uh, feeding tube, uh, we would strongly encourage you all to have those conversations direct, directly with your supplier representatives to understand what that product availability will have, what potentially what new um, uh, new products might be made available to you with the NFIT connectors, and of course their timing and availability. Um, I'm going to move on to another question. I'm getting, I'm getting a few related to when will all these products be available. And um, the answer to that question, again, goes back to uh, the suppliers, your manufacturers, your distributors. Um, what, uh, what we try to do with Getson, the Stay Connected initiative, is try to uh, provide everyone a general sense of timing um, and a common message and a single voice in terms of the introduction of NFIT. Um, 
we uh, guide and suggest and recommend to manufacturers that they have their product available in a certain time period, which is now, uh, to meet California legislation deadlines, as well as uh, get to a safer place as soon as possible around the country and around the globe. Um, ultimately, though, that supply is really up to the manufacturer. So again, I can't stress enough the importance of working directly with your supplier representatives to understand their precise timing of what products are available with the NFIC connectors and when they'll be available. Um, so please reach out um, uh, to those uh, representatives to understand their precise timing. And the answer may depend. It may depend on um, supply chain uh, challenges. Uh, it, may, it may depend on which products you're referring to and what you need. Um, Peggy did mention that uh, very, very important is as soon as that, that NFIT feeding tube uh, goes into a patient, you really de need to make sure that you have adequate supply of syringes. And if a patient's being discharged, make sure some syringes go home with that patient as well so they are able to care for themselves over the coming days and weeks uh, so that their home care provider of, of supplies will be able to, to backfill that demand. Okay, um, the next question is on, uh, there's a question on the large, uh, large syringes and uh, will those um, catheter tip syringes continue to be available and be used with the NFIT connector? Um, and the answer to that is ac actually no. Uh, the cat, well, I should, let me clarify. Catheter tip syringes may certainly be available for other uses outside of enteral. But once you have an enteral feeding device with an NFIT connector, uh, you'll need to have an NFIT tip syringe. Um, and those will be available in, in many sizes, uh, up to 60 ml and potentially larger, depending on your supplier. Uh, but you will need to have those NFIT tip syringes in order to be compatible with the NFIT feeding system in those feeding tubes. Uh, another question has come in here uh, regarding a uh, PEG tube. Okay, so if a patient has an old PEG tube, do they have to get it changed out or will there always be uh, adapters or these transition connectors available? And that's an excellent question. Um, Peggy did mention that um, long term, we do want to get away from this world where we have to rely on adapters. We ultimately want to get to a place where these connectors can work together directly and not require an additional part or component. The transition connectors are made available today because we want to ensure um, uh, what we call backwards compatibility. And the primary reason for this is that we know patients have tubes in place for months and sometimes even years. And so we do, for this, this transition period, want to make sure that those transition connectors are made available. Um, but eventually, uh, the intention is for those to go away as the tubes are replaced. Uh, so we don't want to cause any unnecessary procedures and have uh, a PEG tube have to be replaced immediately, uh, but we do want you to be thinking about when's the appropriate timing to go ahead and make that change um, of those feeding tubes. I just want to mention one thing. Um, as we're talking about um, speaking and communication with manufacturers, I think it's important to remember that um, clinicians don't always talk to the manufacturers directly, but every agency and every institution has some type of supply chain folks, um, supply chain personnel or um, your DME companies do as well. And so make sure that you're talking to someone. Um, if you don't feel comfortable calling up the manufacturer directly, um, you don't see sales reps, that kind of thing, um, but you will be able to contact your institutional um, uh, supply chain folks um, or talk to your group purchasing individuals or your, your warehouse distributing individuals then they can talk directly to the manufacturers as well. That's just another alternative. Thank you so much for that addition. Um, okay, so I we have a, uh, time for a couple more questions and I want to make sure we're covering a uh, broad, broad spectrum of questions that are coming our way. Okay, so there is one question from Craig, and that is, is BD going to support the NFIT standard, or are they looking at other alternatives? Some of you have seen communications directly from uh, BD. Uh, I will uh, clarify that at one point BD was a member of Getson, and supportive of the NFIT initiative. Uh, more recently, they have uh, made it public that they uh, are supporting the ISO standard but are choosing to look at other alternatives besides NFIT. Um, 
And I want to clarify what NFID is, is the uh, specific orientation of a female feeding administration set or syringe that goes into a male feeding tube. And we believe the orientation is important. Um, uh, for a safer connection and to provide, make sure there's one system that's provided. I cannot speak any further to what um, uh, BD's plans are moving forward. I, I will say though that if you are reliant on syringes from, from that supplier um, and you're looking for an NFIT syringe, uh, you may need to be looking at other uh, supply sources. Um, and so, uh, so hopefully that makes sense for everyone. Uh, there's another question from Ashley. Are the nasogastric tubes going to have the NFIT connector? Um, and the answer to that is yes, absolutely. If, uh, if uh, that product is uh, indicated for enteral feeding, uh, nasogastric, nasoenteric tubes, uh, they'll have the NFIT connector included on them. Okay, uh, looks like we have time for one last question. Lots of great questions, by the way. I appreciate everyone uh, uh, offering up uh, these questions. Let's see, I think we've captured most of the questions that have been raised um, in terms of product availability, the various types of tubes. Um, okay, this is a, an important one uh, that I think everyone needs to understand. And Peggy, you might need to help me with this one. Um, Angelina asks a question, I understand how misconnections may occur, but how many various tubing routes need to be identified? For instance, does oxygen tubing require labeling by standards? Um, and, and, and so one of the things that's important to recognize is the ISO 80369 uh, is the standard for small bore connectors. At the current time, they've identified six therapeutic areas um, that really do require small bore connectors that do not misconnect with something other than what it's intended. And so Entral is one of them. Entral is the 80369-3. Um, but there are other connectors that have been identified, small bore connectors that need to uh, adjustment. So respiratory is one, neuraxial is one, uh, limb cuff inflation connectors, and then IV uh, and hypodermic applications, which will continue to use the lure lock and others will, uh, will change around them. So those are some of the connectors that have been identified. The enteral feeding or NFIT connectors are the first in this series to be introduced, but you should expect to see other uh, new connectors uh, made available in the market um, to help uh, satisfy this issue of two misconnections and ultimately get to a safer place. Uh, Peggy, care to, to add any comments on that, onto that? No, that was a great explanation, Tom. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, uh, it looks like that's all we have time for. It's 12.59. At this point, I really appreciate everyone uh, logging in to the webinar, and I'd like to turn this back over to Emily to close out the session. Tom, thank you. Peggy, thank you so much for a wonderful discussion there. The material that you've covered with us today is vitally important in learning what you need to know about adopting the new enteral connectors. I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the audience today, and as well to those of you attending this recorded session for your time and your thoughtful attention. So with that, everyone, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Take care and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.